Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 353, I chat with calibrator Dave Abrams about the Sony A1E OLED TV. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded May 11th, 2017. Episode 353, Sony A1E OLED TV. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here, the Home Theater Geek and editor of AVSForum.com. This week's guest geek is David Abrams, calibrator extraordinaire and president of Avocal here in Southern California. Hey, Dave, welcome back to the show. Hey, Scott. Thanks for having me. Oh, always happy to have you here because uh, we always have great discussions. Those are who are tuned in live at live.twit.tv can join the chat room there or at irc.twit.tv. And you can post questions as we go, and I'll pass along as many as I can. Always helps if you use my screen name, which is my name, Scott Wilkinson. No dots or dashes or anything like that. Somewhere in the message, because then it shows up in a different color on my screen, and I can see it more easily. So Dave and I are starting a new project that I think everyone, all of uh, my audience here, will be very happy to hear about. Uh, we're going to be taking a look at TVs as we move forward, different ones, and reporting our findings right here on Home Theater Geeks. Uh, the first uh, part of that process uh, will be in Dave's studio. In fact, the whole thing will be taking place in Dave's studio. Um, but uh, he's going to be taking the measurements, doing the calibrations, uh, talking with me about what he finds, and then uh, I'm going to be looking at content. Dave, of course, will be looking at content as well. And uh, I'll be writing it up on AVS, and we'll be talking about it here on Home Theater Geeks. So it's going to be really, really fun, and we're going to be looking at higher-end TVs. So, you know, it's going to be on the expensive side of things, but, you know, we're geeks. We want to we hear about what's the best that's out there, right? So this is our first entry into that process. We're going to be talking about the Sony A1E OLED. But before we get into that, uh, I'd like, Dave, for you to tell us a little bit about your studio, um, how you set it up, the wall color, the lights. You know, it's uh, I've been there and I know that it's a really nice place to be looking at video. But tell us about how you put it together. Sure, Scott. So we wanted a place that we could control the light. So, of course, it doesn't have any windows. So sometimes <laughs> you find yourself there at three in the morning and you don't realize it's three in the morning. But uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's really nice in that way. We have black tile throughout the uh, throughout the studio as well as um, some GTI. I had to look this up here one sec. GTI Munsell Neutral Gray Paint. And I think yep. I was trying to remember before the podcast, I think we went with N7 because it's a little bit lighter. And the, the lab isn't very large, as you've seen. So we wanted to make sure that we didn't make it fully black because then you'd think you were just in a black hole. But the, uh, <laughs> the ceiling, you know, the, the, the ceiling we made uh, black. We hung black fabric over it. And then, we, again, the black tiles, the gray walls. So you're really in a black and, uh, well, a gray scale of a room. Mm -hmm. And uh, even the desks are, are black and gray and, and the chairs are you know, stainless man, steel and gray. And you're a man after my own heart. I did the yeah. same thing when I worked at uh, Sound and Vision. Well, I worked at Home Theater Magazine. Uh, and I established a studio that did exactly the same thing. You worked in there for a while when I when it was with Perfect Vision. Yeah, yeah. Um, I did the same thing. I painted the walls uh, that uh, Munsell gray. I think I painted mine a little darker than you did. My home theater is the same. It's a little darker, but it's Munsell gray, um, which is very neutral. It has no hue in it, so that whatever light it is reflected from it. Uh, is reflected accurately, so to speak. It is not given a hue of any sort. So, you know, that's super geeky, but hey, this is home theater geeks. So <laughs> that's what it's all the, about. That's what it's all about. So black right. floor, uh, neutral gray, Munsell, what's called Munsell gray. And uh, my 
my living, my home theater, I think is at 9% reflectivity. I don't remember the end number. Um, yours is a little bit lighter than that, but not much. Um, and the reason, of course, as I said, is it's so that light, any light that is reflected around isn't distorted in its color. Yes, and then we we went with the Philips Hue system throughout the office, and then we oh, actually for the took for the lighting, yeah. And then we took the uh, the reflectance standard, the photo research reflectance standard, and calibrated the light to <laughs> V sixty five as close as we could get it. I love that. And, you know, with and those are LED lights. The color is controllable. How how accurately did you get to D sixty five? With, with those lights. I'm curious to know. I've never used them myself. So we were measuring about, I think it was 315330 or 311, right? Really close, really close yeah. to D65. And it does look pretty good off the paint. Um, I've always wanted to take a little more time with it and see if we could uh, uh, put up some, our, our reference OLED, right? The RGB OLED that we have in the office is the standard and mm -hmm. sort of put white up on there and then perceptually see if we could match the light, maybe even a little closer to the spectral response of the OLED mm. <laughs> so that they really, so they're really <laughs> in sync with each other, but I just haven't had the time. By the way, uh, the numbers that Dave just said were the coordinates in the CIE chart where the point of white is. And the ID, and D65 is 313329. And you got, what did you say again? I think we had about 315330331 right oh, around there. Oh, man. So it's like a <laughs> one or two thousandths off. So... That's good enough for me. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I bet you I could get it a little faster, or a little closer, except when you're adjusting the Philips Hue system, it's not like the finest of things in the app mm. to kind of drop, yeah. you know, the, the slider and you're adjusting the coordinates. Um, I, I think they've updated that, though, so maybe I should take another look at it. Maybe we can get it dead on. <laughs> well, I know you and I are very much the same in that we want to get things as dead on as possible. Even calibrations, which... As long as you're under a certain error, which we'll talk about during this in this show, uh, then it's said to be indistinguishable from completely correct. Uh, but even so, I try to get my errors down as low as possible, and I know you do too. So uh, uh, we're brothers in that respect as well. Now you mentioned your 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 um, reference OLED monitor which you have there to compare to other TVs and monitors that come in. Tell us a little bit about that reference monitor. So we went with the Flanders Scientific, which if you're in the broadcast world, it's a pretty popular brand. Um, they take the Sony RGB OLED, the broadcast OLED uh, that's that's used throughout most of, most of Hollywood at this point, and put it in their own chassis, sort of like Sony with the A1E has, has purchased the LG Glass, right? And they take the right. LG Glass OLED, they put it in, they put their image processing behind it, they put their inputs behind it, their software. And that's what Flanders does on the broadcast side. And they do a really phenomenal job of it. One of the things we like is you can pretty much calibrate it to any standard that you want through either a 1D LUT or a 3D LUT or both, right? So you, can, you have a lot of flexibility in it. And we wanted to have something that was really a, a reference grade monitor that just uh, performed above the rest. And again, this is one of the monitors that a lot of content is being mastered on in Hollywood. So to have that in the office as our reference when we're comparing other displays really helps a lot to see how things fare up against sort of, you know, the holy grail of, of displays. Sure. Well, and, and as I've said many times, the goal of a consumer TV is to reproduce what the director or the colorist or whoever worked on the content, what they saw in their studio. So if you can get a consumer TV to look the same as a professional monitor, such as they would use in the mastering suite, uh, grading suite, then, then you're golden. That's exactly what you need. Exactly, exactly. And that's one of the reasons why we wanted to have it is, again, you know, we have some monitors that come in and out of here from time to time, and we want to make sure that, okay, we, we see how well it performs in the measurements, but how does it look perceptually to one of these, these uh, reference monitors? And, and sometimes, you know, you're impressed, and sometimes you're a little disappointed of, oh, wow, you know, it measured so well, but that contrast just doesn't line up with the OLED or, you know, I, oh, I noticed the, the color shifting against the panel. You can really see against the, 
the OLED and, and the great uniformity that that has. Um, so those types of things can really become more apparent when you have that reference right next to the monitor. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, it's going to be great to, and we we did do that in fact with the with the Sony OLED, and we'll get into that. But uh, it's great to have that sort of reference sitting there next to. Now the Flanders uh, monitor is smaller. It's what thirty inches. Twenty five. Twenty five inches. Okay. So it's and pretty small it retails, compared to TVs. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty small, and I think it retails for about eighty five hundred. So it gives you an idea of how much these run. A twenty five inch monitor for eighty five hundred dollars. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. It, it's pricey. <laughs> anybody tried to sell a consumer TV twenty five inch for eighty five hundred bucks? Uh, well, they wouldn't get any takers. Um, but that means that the Sony itself, the Sony X three hundred, which is a thirty inch OLED RGB OLED. Uh, is, I don't remember, but it's certainly in the five figures. I believe the BVMX 300 is 42000 on the price sheet as retail, but I think they go for about 29000 on the market. Mm -hmm. I think you find them right around $29,000 for the BVMX 300, which is 30 inches, right? 30 inches, 4K, right. HDR, yep. Yep. Uh, beautiful monitor, just calibrated one this morning. I uh, love that thing, and uh, but yeah, it's it's pricey. It's about a thousand dollars an inch. <laughs> Man, oh, that brings that though. The the thinking about calibration though brings me to um, UJ's question here in the chat room. So, how is the reference monitor calibrated? It's it's calibrated in the same way that you would calibrate any video display, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, well, so it's calibrated the same right to the same targets and the same standards that we're trying to do with every display except with the with broadcast monitors we're seeing a larger shift towards 3d lookup tables and 1d lookup tables so instead of going in and say adjusting your rgb bias or gain controls for say two point grayscale or even a 10 point grayscale in something like the sony a1e you're able to profile the monitor. So you basically make a, a bunch of measurements, anywhere from maybe 100 to 10,000 measurements in the display, get its its color profile, and then through software, you calculate what's called a lookup table, a conversion table. Think of it as EQ for your display, right? You, know, mm. you have uh, your, your treble, your bass, your mid, but you have a lot of these, a whole slew of right. adjustments that you can use. It's it's like a really and, fine and, graphic EQ, shall we say. Exactly, exactly. So you calculate that, you load it, and then you test against it, right? So then you run your test patterns in and you try to figure out, okay, well, now am I hitting the target that I want to hit? And if you are, then you're you're calibrated. And if not, you got to take a step back and see what might have gone wrong. The only thing I don't like about lookup tables and doing this type of calibration is it can it can hiccup you can get a point where you don't have enough pattern delay or your computer kind of gets out of sync with your generator because it puts up a pattern it takes a reading and then it logs the data and if you get out of sync or something isn't quite right you often don't know until you actually go to compile and look at your LUT so you could actually take uh, on, the, on the older LG OLEDs when we were building lookup tables for them we would take about 10,000 measurements, and that would take about three and a half hours approximately with, with the which, equipment which, we have. Which is an automated process, though, right? I mean, you set it up, you and then you go get dinner, and you come back three and a half hours later, right? Absolutely, yes. You, you can set it up, go get dinner, come back three hours later. But if it goes wrong, then you got to find out what uh, was wrong and then uh, start it over. So there's no like going back to the middle, whereas where you're calibrating, let's say, a 10-point grayscale, you know, you get a bad reading or something doesn't look right. You just remeasure it and readjust it. You don't have to keep going back and forth, you know, with hours and hours involved in it. Right. Right. Exactly. But there are some consumers, certainly on uh, viewers of Home Theater Geeks and AVS Forum, uh, who actually use LUTs, uh, lookup tables, uh, for their consumer displays, either in software or more likely in a hardware box, because you can buy a hardware box that provides these LUTs, right? Oh, absolutely. And we see, we see personally, I see a lot of clients here in Los Angeles with the Lumigen video processor. So, and that's that's an excellent LUT box. You know, it's something mm. that not only does your video switching and scaling, but it also allows you to do lookup tables and, you know, their CMS, right? Their color management system, which can be as simple as just adjusting some grayscale, or it can be 
as complex as loading a 3D like table into it. Yeah. One other thing we should mention, make sure that people know about the Flanders uh, reference monitor is it can be calibrated to within an inch of its life uh, for grayscale and color, but it's 1080p, not 4K, right? Absolutely, yes, it is 1080p. The only 4K broadcast OLED is that BPM X300, and I just haven't been able to save up that 30,000 and put that in the office. <laughs> I don't blame you for that. Also, the Flanders is not high dynamic range, or is it? So it has a HDR emulation mode in it. It does about 300 to 350 nits, the panel that I have, and you're able to calibrate it for HDR, but it, you know, again, it'll stop out at 350 nits, which a lot of people would say it's not, it's not real HDR. You need closer to a thousand nits or more to say, oh, I have an HDR, especially when you're mastering content, you really need something at least a thousand nits or higher when you're grading content. So you could get an idea of maybe what it'll look like in HDR on the Flanders, but it's certainly not a reference grade HDR monitor so, for that So reason. people people aren't grading content in HDR on the Flanders monitor? Not on the one I have in the office, not on the DM250. Now right, NAB, right, right. Flanders and announced a 31 inch LCD that will hit 2000 nits that's shipping later this year. So maybe, Maybe after this podcast, they'll be inclined to send us a demo unit. Scott will be able to take a look. <laughs> yeah, at it. I'll, I'll work on that. Sure. <laughs> sure. Uh, but to, to, to your point, uh, even consumer OLEDs today cannot hit a thousand nits. They're they're up in the 500, 600, 700 range. LG claims a thousand, but whether or not they can actually hit it is is a good question. So that that is a great question. Um, so when we were at NAB, we talked to a couple of the manufacturers that have claimed a thousand nits off off the OLEDs, and uh, you know one of the engineers was pretty straight with me. He says, "You know how we do it? We do a smaller window. Mm. It's, you know, just three three percent window. You know, it's <laughs> and you'll get a thousand nits out of the OLED. Just you know, <laughs> yeah, take whatever OLED you have. Doesn't Man. matter. He was he was telling me he's like, doesn't matter if it's LG or or the Sony. You can manipulate it. You know, with a smaller window to get it to to kick up to about a thousand nits." So uh, I haven't seen every single one of, you know, every model OLED out there, right? But, mm -hmm. uh, and I haven't measured them all with a 3% window, but that's when they're claiming a thousand nits on a consumer OLED, they're most likely measuring it with a smaller window from what, from what we've been told. And um, this yes, kind of reminds, this kind of reminds me of uh, amplifier power measurements where they measure it at one specific frequency, typically one kilohertz, to get a power uh, number, but that doesn't really reflect what happens when it's rep when it's reproducing 20 to 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. So it's it's more kind of manufacturer manipulation of the data to hit a certain number, uh, but it's a little misleading, it seems to me, in some cases. Absolutely, I mean, it, it's, it can be misleading for sure. And you also have to remember, you know, the argument that you hear at all the uh, SIMTI meetings and everyone saying, you know, contrast is so important. And so you see some of these monitors that can do a thousand nits or 1500 nits, but they don't have the black level of an OLED. So right. you don't have as much perceived contrast as you may have with the OLED at times. You know, there are some LCDs out there that are phenomenal, you know, the Sony yeah. Z90. Phenomenal, yeah. you know, love that set. It's it's amazing, but uh, but there are certainly some that play the game, right? So there's some sets on the market, middle cost, lower cost sets that will hit a really high light output really quickly, and then if you try to hold that white window up on the screen for more than a second or two, you know, you see it start to dim, or vice versa, you'll see some, you know, the backlight kind of catch up, and you'll see it be a little low really initially, and then you'll see it get a little brighter as it sits on the screen for a few mm. minutes and the backlight mm. kind of cranks up. So there's certainly some some games that are being played and, you know, there's engineering reasons and there's cost reasons. And, you know, it's not like manufacturers are trying to pull one over on on anyone really specifically, but energy regulations and then heat, right? Heat issues and, yeah. and power issues and cost issues, right? All become uh, a, a bigger problem. And even at NAB, I think we might have mentioned on the the podcast the other day a couple of weeks we ago yeah. With, yeah we talked about um some of these monitors that 31 inch lcd that's 2000 nits i'm going well when are we going to see this in a consumer product and the answer from the manufacturer was 
when we can get liquid cooling into the panel. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, you know, and he goes, and, and the reason isn't that we can't get the liquid cooling in it. The problem is, is people don't think people are going to want to buy a thicker a flat panel because we've made them so thin, right? They keep getting thinner and thinner and thinner. Yeah. And if you start yep. putting, like liquid cooling and all of a sudden they're going to get thicker and thicker and thicker. And right. so it's, wait, we're going backwards. Now they're getting uglier. Why are we doing this? <laughs> so, yeah, but they got, now they've got a radiator in them. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Jeez. Jeez Louise. Okay. Well, um, so now we've set the stage. We, we know we have a, a very good environment with the, properly painted walls and ceiling and lighting and a reference monitor sitting right next to the TV that we we are investigating. And the first one that we want to talk about here is the Sony A1E OLED. So this is an OLED TV, OLED, organic light emitting diode, is the technology name. Uh, we call it OLED or OLED. And it uses an LG panel, as you mentioned before, which basically means it's the OLED material. OLED material glows. It emits light directly upon electrical stimulation. And the Sony broadcast monitor, the BVM uh, X300 and the Flanders have red, green, and blue OLED material. So little, little piece of OLED material glows red, another one glows green, another one glows blue. And three of those form a pixel. With the LGs, however, it's white OLED material. It glows white. And then they put red, green, and blue filters in front of the little tiny subpixels, just like an LCD TV. And they also leave one little tiny subpixel clear so that the white shines through. So it's sometimes called a W OLED or white OLED uh, because it has an extra white subpixel. Uh, the reason being, as far as I've come to understand, is so that it can get brighter. If you have a white subpixel and it and you want to churn out as much light as possible, you uh, you you crank that guy up as well as the R G and B, and you're going to get more more peak brightness out of it. Uh, so as, at least that's my understanding. Do you have is that your understanding as well, Dave? Yes, that's my understanding as well. That they they need the white subpixel in order to let a little bit more of that natural light from the panel through the system to get it brighter. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's what we that's the first thing we started looking at. And before we talk about the results of that particular set, I also wanted to just sort of go over your measurement protocols. And we're in the process, you and I, of defining exactly what the protocol is going to be going forward. This is our first our first project together, and there will be many more. But um, tell us a bit about sort of the general way you approach measuring TVs. Well, generally, I think, you know, the first step is always starting with finding the best picture mode, right? You want to try and find the most accurate picture mode and or the picture mode that allows you to get the most accurate picture. So some some picture modes may not have as many of adjustments as other picture modes. So the first thing is getting it out of the box, you know, burning it in. You want to get a, a little uh, wear and tear on it, making sure it's software updated, making sure everything's in order with it. And then going through the process of, okay, well, let's look at, you know, you can usually tell something like Vivid is probably not going to be your ideally calibrated <laughs> mode. That'll, but that'll not be my first choice generally, no. No, you can usually tell that pretty quickly, but you know, if it gets close, you start making the measurements, you start saying, okay, well, where's my grayscale here? How's my color gamut mapping going? Do I have, do I have any range? Do I have any adjustments? You may find a mode where you go, oh, this mode might look good, but I don't have any grayscale adjustments. I can't adjust the grayscale. So, okay, let me find the mode that's now going to let me do that. Um, and then, and then, and in some sense you might find there's actually more. And I think what I'm seeing more and more in the industry is memories like vivid and sports and movie for the most part are starting to just become a name for memory one, memory two, memory three, meaning a lot of these modes have all the adjustments in them and you simply have different starting points from them. And mm. you can almost get most of them to match. Now there are some things in, in some TVs and some settings where, yeah, there's an underlying 
uh, process happening outside of the user menu, maybe in the factory menu, or even, maybe even more deep, something you can't get to that's uh, maybe a specific lookup table or, or color table in that vivid mode that you simply can't adjust. But uh, in a lot of TVs nowadays, a lot of it's being put into the user menu. And, and one of the things I like about Sony is they love to tell you what they're doing for the most part. So uh, what I mean by that is, you know, when you go to color space, you can choose Rec 709. There's no hmm. wide. There's no normal. What's normal, right? What's yeah, wide? Exactly. Until, you me- until you measure it, you don't know. But on a Sony, and, and not just the A1E, but on a lot of their sets, they're very attuned to, okay, well, we're going to call that Rec 709 because that's HD color. We're going to call that Rec 2020 because that's ultra HD color, right? And we're going to call that one DCI-P3. It even has DCI-P3 in a consumer TV, which is which is awesome. I mean, I don't know how many people really need that, but it's awesome. Well, you, you, do, you do need it. Be, well, uh, yes, Ultra HD Blu-ray is specified for Rec 2020 color, but here's a little wrinkle. At the moment, there are no TVs that can do 2020 color. Uh, they are, in fact, more closer to DCI-P3, which is the color gamut that's used in commercial cinemas. And so that's what most UHD Blu-rays are mastered to or graded to right now is DCI-P3. So why wouldn't you pick DCI-P3 if you had that choice in your color space menu? Would you would you always pick 2020 for a UHD Blu-ray? Yes, Scott. So you would actually pick 2020 for the UHD Blu-ray, and here's why. So the system, the, the standard is uh, Rec 2020. And, and the way you kind of need to think about it, and Stacy Spears actually helped me a lot with kind of getting my mind into this different mindset, right? Like there is no spoon, right? You know, it's, it's you kind of have to think about it. <laughs> there is no spoon, right? Yeah, you kind of have to think about it a little more abstractly. So the 2020 is a container and right. uh, you're filling that container with color. And um you might only be looking at DCI P3 at the P3 color gamut um, on your monitor when you're mastering, which is how a lot of stuff is being done because that's the limit of a lot of these displays that are out there today is the P3 color gamut. Right. But when they're mastering the content onto the disc, the digital bits, the data of like where that RGB, let's say triplet is, right? So let's say it's you know 275, 275, 275, which would be white, but let's just use that for the sake of me not having to think about what would equal what. <laughs> um, what would actual red be? Yeah, right. Yeah, what would red be at you know 50% luminance and this and then, you know whatever. Anyway, so if you're if you're thinking about it that way, uh, that is just going to map within this container. So the container is yay big, but your mm-hmm. display can only do this that much. much. But you're yeah. still you're still putting the data in this container. You're just not putting data at these edges because there's no data to to have there per se. You're just you're only working with the the P3. So the TV then looks at the container and only maps to the edge of what it has. So if that's P3, it just fills it up to P3 and ignores anything outside of it. For, so in other words, know, the, so, the, contain, the container isn't completely full, shall we say, as a metaphor. Exactly. So w- from the decode standpoint, if you were to decode P3, if the set's like, oh, I think uh, this is P3, it's now going to try to map data in the 2020 format into the p3 space so you're gonna you're gonna have some error conversion error there where it's it's not interpreting what that bit level is and where that bit level should be within the 2020 space so on the tv you generally want to go to that 2020 space and then you want to allow um you know the the data wants you to go to the 2020 space and you want to allow the display to then map that to the 2020 space as well even though you may not get anything more than p3 from it right right so when um, we, when we uh, oh sorry Scott just one more thing so when yeah. we calibrate when a, when a calibrator calibrates today a lot of what we're doing is we're we're generating 2020 data and measuring for P3 and even at the studios for for a lot of the displays because very few are going wider than that for a lot of the displays out there there are a couple like that BVMX 300 that can go further out and you can kind of play with it and say I'm going to put it in 2020 and measure 2020 and and you, you'll see what it does. 
But for most displays, we, we generate 2020 and then we set our systems, our calibration systems to measure the P3 targets. Otherwise, you're just going to see the stuff clips out at the edge and everything scrunched together. And you, you, you can't really tell what's going on because it's, it's being clipped out at the end. Right, right. Um, okay, so we've, we're, you pick the right mode. Um, you you measure you you pick the right uh, color standard. Uh, you pick the right color temperature, which in most cases on consumer TVs, I don't know about Sony. Does Sony actually specify color temperature in terms of degrees Kelvin, or do they also like most do uh, cool, normal, and warm? You know that's that's a good point. Actually, Sony does do cool, normal, and warm. I think it's. Uh, I think there's a warm and maybe even a warm too. But it would right. be nice if they actually did put the the Kelvin, wouldn't it? Have, maybe it we can get great. them to do that. Maybe yeah, we maybe. can. If somebody's watching, yeah. think about that. And, yeah, and oddly, right? oddly, the, the the color temperature mode that is usually the most accurate is the warm one. Yes, absolutely. The The most accurate mode in almost any TV on the market is one of the warm ones, right? A lot of sets now have a warm one and a warm two. We see that, oh gosh, in, in you know, most sets I think out there have, have more than one warm, but usually one of them is closer to the D65 standard white point that we're shooting for. Right, exactly. Um uh, okay, so then you know you take your measurements. Now, in the case of the Sony A1E, uh, you did not measure the. You you tried to find the best mode, of course, but then I you didn't take a full set of measurements because in this particular case, is you sort of started with this one before we had decided to do this project, and and you'll do it in the future. But uh, which, which modes did you find to be the most accurate? So the, the modes that are most accurate are the Cinema Pro and the Custom, from, from what I found. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wanted to see if there was a difference, really, between Cinema Pro and Custom. On the, on the Z9D, I don't know how many people know this, but when they, they had software updated the Z9D at some point and added the Custom mode in high dynamic range, uh, does a hard clip. So it doesn't do any of the tone mapping that you'd get in HDR that a lot of that you're supposed to do. And Sony did this very purposefully for people like myself who would like to see what things like look like without the tone map turned on. And so it was a very much welcome addition, but you then have to remember that, okay, well, when I want to watch real content at home, I, I need to go to Cinema Pro. Now, I didn't see this on the A1E. I saw the A1E where the Cinema Pro mode and the, the custom mode weren't doing a hard clip. They were, they were doing their tone mapping and, and rolling off. And I'd love, you know, I'd love to get the hard clip into the A1E if there's someone that I could talk to and maybe make that happen. That'd be great. But, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll By the way, we should, just, we should just make sure everybody understands that cl hard clipping and tone mapping basically means when they... Uh, when they master high dynamic range content, typically it goes up to a peak brightness of 1,000 nits or in some cases even 4,000 nits. No consumer TV can do 4,000 nits um, and only some of them can do 1,000 and OLEDs typically cannot. So as the content gets brighter and brighter, the, the process of what's called tone mapping starts to roll off the brightness so that it doesn't actually try to exceed what the TV can actually do. Whereas hard clipping is, it goes up to what the TV can do, and then it's just hard clipped. And it, that can look kind of ugly. So the tone mapping is a good thing to, to use when you're looking at real content. But for us geeks, it'd be nice to have, a, you know, a no tone mapping mode, so to speak. And I throw out there, Scott, uh, it would be awesome for uh, whether it's it's – easily accessible or whether it's like a special code or a special mode or something you have to punch into the set, but mm. to have every display able to disable tone mapping for calibration mm. because you shouldn't calibrate against the tone map, right? Because the tone mapping is something that should be there, but it's, it's purposely changing where the luminance would be for the data you're sending. So for example, you have a thousand nit TV, but a 4,000 nit source. Well, you can't see what's it. 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 nits. So that has to be squeezed in 
to that thousand nit TV, which is where the tone mapping is doing that roll off. But if you're measuring right. that roll off, it makes it look, especially when you're doing color measurements, color gamut measurements, color volume, you'll notice that things are skewed because luminance comes into play with that. So it, it'd almost be beneficial from a calibration standpoint if you were able to disable the tone map, do your calibration, then turn that back on so you know, okay, I was targeting this and I got it hitting where it needs to be and, and, and the EOTF is measuring properly and the color is measuring properly for what this set can do and then add the tone map back in to do the compensation for, for the system. Sounds like exactly the same sort of thing that when you're doing a calibration, you also want to turn off all other automatic functions, right? Like uh, auto contrast and uh, various things that might be in the TV's menu system. You want to turn all that off for cal for calibration at least. Yeah, yeah. You you generally want to turn off uh, anything that's auto, anything that's altering picture. So there's there's this mindset of with with displays in general. So we want to display to show the picture just the way the picture was and not to add its own look and feel to the picture. Right. But it gets really hard with today's technology because we've got these LCDs with dynamic backlights. Well, when we master right. content, we're not using a dynamic backlight. The, the, the display is X amount of brightness and has Y gamma curve and, and uh, content creators are looking at a display that's very fixed, right? It's not changing its brightness based on a darker scene or a lighter scene. Right. But because these LCDs don't necessarily have the contrast that they'd have without it, it doesn't appear to be as pleasing of an image, right? And, and I'll agree, like I, I'll look at a set like let's say the Sony Z9D. You turn that local dimming off and it's not as impressive as with the local dimming on. It looks a lot more impressive with the local dimming on. Mm -hmm. But you don't want to necessarily fight that when you're trying to track your gamma. You don't want to uh, measure 10% gray, 20% gray, 30% gray, and have the local dimming getting brighter and brighter more so than the pattern is because you want to you want to make sure your data and your video signal is being processed properly. Then you sort of add on to that the look of the display. And so some people will try to calibrate uh, with some of these things on because they're like, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna watch the picture with this turned on, so why wouldn't I try to calibrate it with it on? But my argument always is, well, you're not watching a 10% window or a 20% window or a 30% window, you're watching a very dynamic image that's changing quite a bit. And so if right. you, you end up picking that 10% window or 10% APL or something along those lines, it's not, it doesn't translate very realistically to all the scenes that you're going to be watching. So really what starts to make a set and, and it's hard to quantify, maybe you and I can figure out a way to quantify this in, in the lab and, and, and put it in our reviews, but it's hard to quantify how good is a manufacturer's dynamic backlighting algorithm, mm, right? How good. How, how yeah. good is that? And what ones are more obtrusive, right? That you're going to be more bothersome by like, I, one of the things I talk about with clients is pumping, what I call like a pumping in the display, where you'll see the display get bright and then you see the backlight get brighter, or you see the the, the display get go to a dark scene and then you see the backlight get darker. So you kind of see it pump a little bit between right. these different scenes, and that that bothers me to no end. I know some it, people don't even notice it, don't even no, see it. It bothers me too to no end. I always turn that stuff off. Yeah. So, but it'd be it'd be interesting to see who might do a better job and who has the least amount of uh obtrusiveness the least amount like mm. maybe it was someone if we can measure how fast it is or something right. you know we can see oh this this dynamic backlight is 10 times faster than that dynamic backlight right, right 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 but right. that starts to get really tough to do and you need some pretty expensive equipment last time i was thinking about it to to, to do mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. okay well uh, let's get into uh the sony then oh before we do one more thing about the sony that i want to make sure everybody understands is this one control that turned out to be really important called extended dynamic range. Tell us what that is. So extended dynamic range has been on uh, these displays for quite a while. And it's something that's necessary if you're doing high dynamic range. You need to get the, the most light out of the set. And what it 
what it does, and I didn't spend a ton of time, you know, getting very specific with it, but it's changing the modulation of the display and 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 the the power regulation. And uh, a lot of the listeners might remember the ABL, right? The automatic brightness limiter of plasmas. And if you put up, let's say, a ten percent window on a plasma, you measure it, you get a hundred nits. You put up a full screen white, something that encompasses the entire screen, and you might get you know, 60 nits of brightness. So you've lost, let's say, 40% of your brightness when you go to full screen white. And it's not necessarily, it's not ideal. Don't let me, I don't want to like make people think it's it's a great thing, but it's not ideal, but it's not as obtrusive as that makes it sound because it's it's not as detrimental because how often do you have a full white screen on your display? Very little, maybe an explosion or a fade to white or something along those lines. Right. Or, you know, or, or the, the movie, have you seen the movie, The Art of Flight? Uh, that's yes. not, it's all in snow and it's not completely yeah, so full screen white, but there's an awful lot of bright white on the screen at in many, many shots. So it would be it would be a little more obtrusive during during the art of flight, but uh, so extended dynamic range. What it's doing here is they're they're changing how bright the display can get, uh, and therefore that response. So, for example, we turned it we turned extended dynamic range off, and we were able to measure a ten percent window, twenty percent window, thirty percent window, all at the same nit level. So let's say it was 100 nits. I think it was actually about 95 nits. 95, uh, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it was all the way up to full screen and you didn't see any dimming down. You didn't see any modulation happening. You measured gamma and the gamma measured perfect, and near perfect, I should say, um, mm -hmm. all the way throughout. You really got a really great image, but the downside, it's only 95 nits. It's not It's not super bright. And, and in a properly controlled environment like our office, uh, it's fine. It looked great. I thought it looked awesome. But on, when you, on standard dynamic range material, on Blu-rays and, and broadcasts, that standard dynamic range, what we've had up till recently and still do have a lot of, that's totally fine. That's supposed to be at 100 nits. So, okay, it's at 95. I'll give it five nits. No problem. Yes. And one of my colleagues would say, yeah, but you got to remember that the 100 nits was based off of a certain sized broadcast monitor. And when you're talking about a 65 inch TV, well, nits is then over surface area and you actually have more perceived light than you you know, would have if you had a 30 inch broadcast monitor in the office that's at 100 nits. Right. So it actually would look brighter um, overall. Mm. It would look a little okay. brighter because you have that surface area of light and you're only measuring a small uh, a small portion of it, but it, you know, it's, it's here or there, but you're right. Uh, we're, we're talking about standard dynamic range and the standard, the, the, the reference is a hundred nits of brightness and we're at about 95 uh, nits of brightness and that's after calibration. Uh, and, and it holds that very beautifully. Now, if you want a little more light, you're in a high ambient light room and you need a little more, well, you can get that. You can turn the extended dynamic range into low or medium or high. And the, the brightness goes, uh, quite, quite a bit. Um, I don't remember the exact number. I think it was around 250, 300 Scott. We're, that, well, we're going right? to, we're going to take a look. We're going to take a look at those charts right now. In fact, sure. uh, okay. let's take a look. We're going to skip zero and zero one and go to number one. Which it, and a lot of these graphics are going to be at different window sizes and at di at different extended dynamic range settings. So this one is the standard dynamic range. We're going to start talk about standard dynamic range now, and this is the grayscale at with XDR off at a ten percent window. Um, yes. And so you tell tell us a little bit about what what we're looking at here. So we're looking at a 21 point grayscale. So we measured 21 points and along the uh, bottom there, you can see the zero, five, 10, 15, 20. And so all the different percentages of luminance that were measured and uh, going up to, again, this is, so it's in nits and foot lamberts. Um, so the uh, first Y in candelas per meter squared is 95.45 uh, nits. And in foot lamberts, you'll notice we had a, almost 28, 27 point eight, five nits, eight, six nits, or eight, six foot Lamberts, sorry. Right. Um, right. Uh, there, and again, you'll see the gamma, we were targeting the, the B1886 gamma, which on an OLED comes out to 2.4, uh, and it was tracking, you know, average gamma was 2.4, and if we're looking at our Delta E, our most Delta E was 1.19. Now, Delta I'll, E, but Delta E, by the way, is the amount of error from the, of the error. target. 
using the Delta E2000 formula. Right. Um, so you'll see the max Delta E is 1.19. Now, here's what's awesome about this. We only adjusted the gain. We didn't adjust to 10 point. We didn't need the bias. We were able to do that with just the gain. So and by the way, by the way, the gain is adjusting the luminance of the higher end of the brightness range for red, green, and blue. And bias is adjusting the lower end of the of the brightness range for red, green, and blue. And Correct. we didn't adjust the bias at all. All we had, all you had to do was adjust the gain, which is really good. Absolutely, absolutely. So what it means is. The display's uh, color science that's in there is very, uh, very accurate, very linear, right? So you're making an adjustment at the top end, and that adjustment is now scaling down across to the bottom end fairly, fairly well. You know, if you got into the 10 point, you could probably tweak this a little better, get it below a delta of one. Now, a delta of one or less is considered perfect. Yep. Uh, most people won't. They say that the standard observer shouldn't see. A difference of a delta of one, which is why we, we call it one. That's when you just start to see the difference, really. Well, uh, and there, there are show, many people who say you won't see a difference under three. Yeah, yeah. And there's, I read a study or I looked at a, a paper that was talking about 2.2, .2, right? 2.2 .2 delta being the just noticeable difference mm -hmm. uh, uh, amount. So, so it varies. But again, if you can do a 1.19 max with a average of whatever that was about 0. 0.56 or 0. 0.6 uh that's pretty impressive considering you just did the two point you just did the the gain of the two point grayscale, and you're getting that gamma now of course you set black level properly you set your your contrast properly to make sure you're not clipping you're not crushing you select right. the proper gamma table within the display that's going to hit that 2.4 and you go through your calibration process but it's an extremely impressive display for now let's, for let's take a look right let's take there. a look at number one again and then and then look at number two, which is exactly the same thing, except in a with a full white window. So there's number one. Now we look at number two. And, oh, and we switched. I think we switched to the 14 point. So we're measuring 14 point. We just really did that to save time and get the idea. <laughs> all right. But, but, but still and yeah. all, we still have very similar results, whether it's a 10 percent window. And by that, we mean the window of white occupies 10 percent of the area of the entire screen versus the entire screen being white. And they're very, yes. very similar. You get similar peak brightness, similar gamma, similar uh, errors. Everything's virtually the same. So for standard dynamic range, that works great. Let's take a look at numbers three and four, which are uh, with uh, standard, with the extended dynamic range at low. Uh, so we're going to start with low. And there's there it is with a 10% window. And the next one is 100%. And notice how things go a little wonky. Yes, and you'll notice that the, the graphic just before with the 10% window, again, just the one point of delta E, or of, uh, I'm sorry, grayscale, the gains, uh, the max delta E on this 14 point is 0.97 with an average of 0.46. Again, our average gamma is 2.42 in the, in the top left there. And we're getting now 141 nits of brightness. So we've gone up a noticeable amount in brightness and at a 10% window, um, we're, we're not seeing any real detriment to the picture. In fact, hey, the Delta E's actually went a little bit down. So it does yes. fluctuate a, a little bit in, in, in calibrating a display and yeah. and, uh, yeah. and whatnot. But, uh, but then, then when you, you go to a the, full window, the that's next That's right, one. that's when you take your hit. So you go from 141 nits, right, to 121.33 nits there on the left, it says. And you can see the gamma, of course, the average gamma shifts to a 2.14. And our max delta goes out to 3.29. And as you said... Uh, some people, a delta three, they won't even see it. So, um, you know, and again, that, that delta is mostly based not on color because the color of the grayscale is still pretty good, as you can see by the RGB balance there, but it's more the luminance that's changing, right? So we're losing that brightness. It ramps down a little. Um, right. And uh, then if we, go to, again, if we go to five and six, we'll see the extended dynamic range on medium. Now, here's the 10% window. Again, yeah. looking beautiful. We up 207.2 nits, you know, so we're up over 200 nits now. Our black's still at 0. 0.0002 nits, 2.41 gamma, and a max delta of 1.02. And then we go to full window. We go to the full window, and whoa, things really blow up. Yep, and now, again, full window. We've now dropped back down to about 120 nits. 
of brightness in our max delta now because of that luminance shift has gone up to 12.05. Again, you know, it's this is the extreme, right? So we're seeing a full white. That's going to be the extreme. It's very, again, very yeah, it's rare. It's going to be You're rare. Of, yeah. 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 And, yeah. And so, but but you are seeing some of this uh, this uh, energy modulation, whether it's for heat or power or, um, uh, you know, to avoid crazy burn in on the display, you know, it, 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 you, we don't know exactly why Sony did. We can, we can hypothesize that's probably a heat issue. It's probably an energy consumption issue. And it could be a burn in issue where they're worried about the longevity of the panel. But, uh, but, you know, still it's something that if you had, a high ambient light environment where you needed a little more light. Well, yeah, you can get over 200 nits from this. And for a lot of content, it'll probably look pretty good. But when you start getting into really bright content, you'll start to drift away from that reference grade quality that you can get in the low or, or you know, better the off mode. Better in the off mode, yeah. Uh, moving on to the color. Now we have, you, you also measured the, what we were looking at there was the grayscale, which is the basically the what happens when you're displaying white at different intensity levels which is really gray except at the top which is white and the bottom is called black but it's really black to white through the grays and how accurate is that throughout the entire brightness range you also measured color and in standard dynamic range and we want to take a look at that that would be seven and uh oh it looks like we only only have the the um the window in this particular case. So here we are with with extended dynamic range off, and we're looking at a 10% window. CMS stands for Color Management System, which actually the Sony doesn't have. It doesn't have a set of controls to change where these colors are. But no, nevertheless, we take a, we take a look at them and tell us what we're looking at here. So you know, it doesn't have the the color management system that some other sets have, but. It's sort of a blessing and a curse, right? If you do, if the color uh, management is is properly performed, you don't necessarily require the color management uh, system to to make further adjustments. And Sony's doing a, a phenomenal job with this. What we'll see is that the largest error is out in red, where uh, if you look at the CIE chart on the right side of the page, you'll see. Uh, the different dots are 25% saturation, 50% uh, saturation, 75%, and 100% saturation that we measured. You'll see 25 and 50 are pretty good. And then once you get to 75, you start to get into the, the area where you're starting to get a little oversaturated. And when you get to 100% red, you're a little further out than you'd like. Again, looking at the Delta E chart, on the bottom right, you'll see that red is only just a little bit over 2. Seems to be about 2.25 according to our max Delta E uh, on the left side there. So, you know, again, not, not super high Delta E off. We'd like it to be around one or less. Of course, we'd love a perfect display, sure. but, uh, but very good. And again, this is, uh, simply there's only color and, and, uh, tint hue on the, on the display itself. And, uh, we, I don't think we had to adjust either of them away from their, their default point in the cinema pro or, or custom picture modes to get those results. It kind of fell in with our brightness, our contrast, our gamma, you know, once that stuff kind of gets into place, that's sort of the underlying of how your color is going to perform. Mm -hmm. And Sony's doing an excellent job with their, their color mapping on this display. No kidding. Now, if we look at eight and nine, we will see the uh, extended dynamic range in low in a 10% window, and also then the next one will be in a full window. So here's 10% window, and the next one is in full window. And whoa, with extended dynamic range set to even to low, the errors at different brightness levels for the different colors really shoot up, don't they? Go back to the previous one. There's the previous one. Most errors, except for that 100% red, uh, are pretty low. And then you go to the full window, and Boom, they just jump right up. They're still under three, which is still good, but it's not as good. And then we go to the next two, and we'll take a look at when extended dynamic range is at medium. There's medium and then uh, at the 10% window. And then there's full at full screen. Now they're over 10. Why do, what's, yes. what's going on there? You'll notice if you look at the CIE chart on the right, you'll notice that the, the dots are still fairly in the same place, right? They're still fairly in the boxes 
that we're Which targeting are the targets. there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The boxes are the targets, the dots are the measuring. You'll notice between all these charts, they don't really shift much. What you're seeing in the error is the luminance error. And you can see it on the Delta L chart, the third one down in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, that chart is, is where you're going to see more of that error kind of creeping in and, and causing that havoc, right? Because again, we're doing that, that luminance modulation that's happening in order to get that, that extra light output from the display. And we're also measuring the extreme, you know, this is the extreme of it. And uh, it actually performs pretty good when you think about a lot of the displays out there that have modes such as this or dynamic backlighting modes such as this, where you can kind of crank them up and get a super high amount of light uh, from them. But it's, it's, it is something that is happening. And ideally I would love an OLED that can hit like, you know, maybe 4,000 nits, uh, in that extended dynamic range off mode. And that would be <laughs> yeah. it. Wouldn't yeah. that be awesome? That would be, that would yeah. be truly awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one last thing in, in standard dynamic range before we leave. And that is number 12, which is called color checker. And this is a feature of SpectraCal Calman, the software that most of us, certainly uh, most calibrators and most TV reviewers use to do these measurements. Uh, it's a great piece of software. They're always improving it. Uh, and uh, so here what, we, what we're looking at is what's called the color checker function. So tell us about this. Yeah, so this is the, uh, I believe SpectraCal calls it the color checker SG. And it has a ton of colors that are supposedly most commonly seen, right? So, so you'll notice that if you're, if you look at that chart on the right, you'll notice a lot of dots around the yellow, orange, reddish range. And one of the reasons there's a lot there is because that's where a lot of flesh tones live. Right. And, uh, if it's one thing we can often see as off is flesh tones, right? You look at somebody, you go, I see people. It's what I do all the time when I interact in life and I know what people should look like. And that's not how they should look like, right? So we run the color checker to get an idea of, okay, here are a lot of the common shades or ranges of colors that are out there that might cause a problem. And let's see how this is performing against that, right? So you look at the you look at the primaries and secondaries that we were just looking at with the saturation sweeps, and that only gives you the primaries and secondaries. It doesn't really show you the decoder overall and, and how uh, the display is mapping from point A to point B. And realistically, you'd even measure more than just this if you were really trying to measure like color volume and things within a display. Uh, and again, you know, looking at this color checker, it does fare fairly well throughout. Uh, again, you want one or less and, and you get uh, a max of 2.71 with an average of 0.8. Again, only with the single point grayscale and setting all the other basic stuff up uh you are getting a really really solid result throughout mm -hmm. the, the range here yeah before we move on to hdr uh, ticker toy tech has a question is there is burn in still an issue on newer displays it depends on the technology so oled actually has phosphor in it which is what was in plasmas and crts there is an element of phosphor in oled technology and it can wear in it can burn in uh it's in, in my experience, it's been a little less susceptible than older displays, right? As, as we've made displays and we've gotten better with the technology, they've gotten better at protecting displays against uh, burn-in issues. But yeah, it can still certainly burn in. And it's certainly something that in the studios, we can see it happen. And we have seen it happen where, you know, someone pauses on a frame and takes a phone call and then gets called into a meeting and they come back an <laughs> hour later. And, and there's an image that's kind of retentioned into the display. And depending how bad it was and how long it is, sometimes you can, you can get rid of it. You can, you can make it go away, but, uh, other times it's, it's there and you just have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, moving on to HDR, I want to give people a, a look at what we, what you found in, in HDR mode. And here we're only going to be looking, I believe at 10% uh, windows. I don't think you measured full windows in this particular case, um, but let's, we'll start with, and we should also say that when, when the TV receives an HDR signal, right, there's a signal coming in, it's got some metadata, it says, hey, I'm, a, I'm HDR, the TV goes, oh, okay, I'm going to switch my extended dynamic range into high, because that's what's required in order to play HDR in the first place. Um, but there's another weird thing about, about this particular set and it receiving HDR, and I'm, I hope you know what I'm referring to because I'm going to ask you what it is. 
Um, another weird it's, thing when it's the calibration, the calibration controls. Oh, Don't yes. Change. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so it's a blessing and it's a curse all at the same time. <laughs> like, it's so great. I, like, I, I love it and I hate it. But um, so just to start off, so we measured the 10% window for HDR because that seems to be in the industry today, the best practice window to measure, right? A lot of what's being designed uh, is being designed around people measuring a 10% window. And, and that comes into play because with HDR, we're pushing these sets really hard, no matter whether it's an LCD or it's an OLED or, you know, it's any other type of display, you know, projector, we're pushing these at the limit to get as much brightness out of them as we can. And a lot of displays, you know, can't do that much that bright at a full screen or 20% or 30% or 40% window. So the industry kind of settled on this, this 10% window size. And that's sort of, you should be measuring at this 10%. So we were like, okay, well then there's no point really in, in measuring a different thing because we know it's probably not going to be very good because we are, we can see what's happening in SDR. So let's right. see how it's measuring in HDR. And as you mentioned, the set, when you go into HDR mode, it will stay in the mode you're in. So let's say you're in cinema pro, it'll stay in cinema pro and it will turn into the Cinema Pro HDR memory. Some things get grayed out uh, and some things uh, are, are different. So if you're in extended dynamic range off in SDR mode and you switch into HDR mode, it will, it will go into extended dynamic range high because automatically. that's what it needs to do. That's Yeah, exactly, automatically. But one of the things that we don't like is the color temperature. So the, the color temperature and the advanced color temperature settings will follow it. And it's not bad, but what we find is when you're measuring that higher light, right, it's gotten so bright now, there's a slight color shift in the display. Maybe it's a click green or blue or red or two clicks, right? It's not a ton, but what we noticed was, okay, there's a small color shift when we're measuring this. We'd love to like take out those two clicks of red and just balance out this grayscale and get it just that much tighter with this higher light output. However, it then follows it back to the user menu. So you can't choose, say, expert one color temp and then adjust expert one in SDR, go to HDR, it'll be an expert one with the same settings. And you can't set that separately of SDR. So if you were going to calibrate the display and try to make sure it's, it's perfect, um, what you would need to do is you'd have to switch the color temperature manually in HDR, which, you know, how many people are really going to take the time to go in every time they're watching? Maybe if you're watching an HDR movie, you you may take the time to go switch it. But if you're flicking through channels, like we hope to be in the future, and yeah. you're just watching TV and you go, oh, HDR channel, right? Are you then going to go, oh, oh, let me go in the menu and start changing these <laughs> things? Uh, no, I think not. <laughs> Uh, I've had a couple of clients actually with, with some of these displays that do that, that don't have a separate setting and they'll actually run an HDR source into a separate input or they'll split it. Right. So they'll say, Oh, my HDR inputs two or three or four, and then my SDR is one. And then if it's HDR, I just go to input two because that's Calvary. And all I have to do is hit an input button and it's really quick. So they'll, little, they'll use like a little a, easier. Yeah. 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 Just to make it a little easier. And, and again, we're, we're splitting hairs here. I mean, it's very, oh, close. I know. And it's very clear. Yes, In fact, let's yeah. take a look at number 13, uh, which will show us you did the measurements based on the SDR calibration, but then took measurements of HDR uh, grayscale using those same, uh, those same settings. And here's what we came up with. This is with uh, uh, extended dynamic range at high. Yes. Um, so extended dynamic range at high, a 21 point, uh, grayscale here. Uh, you'll see we're hitting about 680 nits, 679 nits of brightness, uh, at that 10% window. Now the top RGB balance chart is luminance. And then the bottom one is the RGB balance below it. So there are two charts, but one is showing the luminance. And the reason I did that on my CalMan workflow was because we wanted to see what's happening with the tone map, right? What's happening with the lumens? And you can see the tone map happening around 70. Um, at 70%, at 70 stimulus level. Yes, 70% stimulus level, 70% luminance uh, in terms of the pattern. But keep in mind with HDR, the scale's a little different, right? So 70% 
is 70% from the pattern, but a lot of your content might not actually be at 70% because of how bright 70% actually is, right? So it's all, right. you, you kind of have to think about it a little bit differently, but that's where they are performing their tone map. And it's, and it's a shallow tone map. It's not a, a lot. I personally like a tone map like this. I, I would love to, when HDR was first explained to me, right, it was, it's going to be great. There's no more questions of gamma. One of these SMPTE engineers was telling me, he's going, <laughs> you know, it's, it's nit for nit. So like, you know, if something's supposed to be 50 nits of brightness, you calibrate it to 15 nits of brightness. It doesn't matter what the display is. It's not a, a power function. You know, it's actually exact. And I was like, oh, this is going to be great. And then we got into the whole discussion. Wait, what if my display can't do it? Well, it's going to clip it. Oh, wouldn't that look bad, right? Like people, would, you know, these engineers are are very smart, right? These SIMTI guys are like way smarter than I am, and they're mathematicians, and they're doing all the research, and and they're and they're doing their their things, and and so they kind of say, oh, well, we're going to have to do a tone map. We're going to have to roll this off. And right now in the industry, there is sort of a recommended roll off, you know, that's out there, but it's really the wild west. Not everyone is doing a similar roll off, and mm. a lot of companies, I think. More displays I have seen that are doing a more aggressive roll off, uh, and even some of these displays that are brighter than this one are doing a slightly more aggressive roll off. But since most of your image is not in the highlights of HDR, or, or you know, most content's probably not going to be in the in the extreme highlights of HDR. A lot of it's going to be down around you know fifty to I don't know two, three, four hundred nits. Let's say um, you're going to have a lot more 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 content down there. So you know, do you really want to start your roll off really low? I, I personally, I've had these conversations with people. Some people are like, no, you're wrong. This is where you want to do it. This is where we need to do it. But I look at some of these displays with displays with more of a shallow roll off, like the Sony. And I like it. I thought it looked great. Mm -hmm. I, you know, when I looked at, I, I looked at a uh, Mad Max the other day on it and that's a 4,000 nit master. And even though it's only about 680 nits, you know, I didn't realize like, oh my gosh, it's, there's all this content that's just blurring together because of the shallow roll off or, you know, I didn't see that when I was watching the scenes I was watching and I was trying to really push the set. Right, right. Uh, SoCal Ray Jr. in the chat room uh, is asking, how are you inputting HDR patterns? That's a good question, Ray. Um, so... <laughs> For this, I have a few test pattern generators there. So we were using a, for HR, we were using the Kona card, the AJA Kona card, um, which we were outputting RGB. So it was not color matrixed, right? So if you output YUV from a test pattern generator and it doesn't have a BT2020 uh, matrix, it's going to be improperly encoded. So then when the TV sees it, if it says, hey, I'm Rec 709, it's going to decode improperly. So then what we do is we actually go through an HD Fury integral and we inject the metadata and the the proper information so the TV knows what we're sending it and, and how to properly process that. So we'll send the AVI info frame and the, um, and the, gosh, where am I? I'm blanking on the other thing, the, the flag, right? That is going to tell oh, it right. it's HDR. So the, the TV HDR goes in flag, HDR. Right, right. Yeah, the HDR flag and the AVI info frame. And so it, it turns in HDR mode and it says, okay, this is RGB. This doesn't need to be, you know, improperly color processed and doesn't send EDID back to the generator that there are a couple of generators. There's one generator I have at the office, very expensive generator, but sadly out of the HDMI, it goes by the EDID only of the display. And so you have to watch, I learned this lesson the hard way, right? So you're sending it in, I'm going, why is all my color mapping wrong in HDR? Because the it's sending YUV, because the TV says I want YUV. But the generator sends Rec 709 metadata. So it's taking a 709 signal and the TV is then converting it using 2020, which is wrong. Mm. Mm. So then you get an error. So you're like, why is my color management so bad? Why is it going wrong? <laughs> and then you figure out, okay, it's going wrong. So now we can inject it. We can control it with the HD Fury. And that's that's what we were doing in the office. We were using the Kona card to the HD Fury into the display. And what was driving the Kona card was CalMan's, uh, Spectra Cal's Virtual Forge. Okay, which there like you go. I like, I like that generator a lot. Well, we're running out of time here. I want to jump to graphic number 17, which is the CMS, the color system, the color color saturation sweeps 
with uh, extended dynamic range set to high, which is what it needs to be for high dynamic range. And there we can see, uh, you know, it's a little farther off than the SDR. And there's no CMS in the TV, so we can't adjust it. But it's not too bad, right? No, it's not too bad. And here's the thing you have to remember. Tone mapping is on. So right. there, are, there is a roll-off happening here that's part of the display's uh, the display's characteristic of how it's processing the image where Calman does not know what the tone map is, right? It doesn't know what it's doing. So Calman's trying to plot, well, this pattern should measure X with, you know, Y luminance, right? It should be, this is what it should be. And so that's what we're seeing here is how accurate is it to perfection, uh, not including the tone map. And this is something that uh, you can play some tricks in Calman to try and get it uh, to look a little more accurate or kind of take some of the tone mapping out of the equation. But ideally, I think more ideally, it would be great to simply have a mode like the Z9D does where you can turn off the tone mapping and make your measurements to see how the display is performing. Notice on this chart, though, we are measuring DCI-P3, Scott. So this is one of those situations where the CIE chart on the right, that the large triangle is REC 2020. And right. then what you're looking at is 25% saturation sweeps of P3. It doesn't go out to the edge of red, the edge of green, and, and even the edge of blue there because it's, it's P3 color fits. And we know this display won't quite hit uh, 2020. And this is how it's, it's dealing with that P3, which again, as you mentioned, is how a lot of content is being mastered today. It's very close. You know, I mean, overall, it's very close. And I think if you were to take the tone map out of it, you'd see it even get closer because we wouldn't be measuring against that. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, number 21 is the color checker in HDR. And let's take a look at that. Uh, and we can see that, what are we looking at? So we did a, a smaller color checker here, and we try to keep it inside uh, where a lot of the colors would live. Because if you start getting to the edge, you're just going to start seeing a lot of error from you know where you hit the display's limitation uh, of how far out it can actually go. Um, but again, we're seeing something that's, again, I, I attribute a lot of it to the tone map that's within the, the display and, and those, those limitations of the display itself, right? Ideally we'd have the ability to do more light. We would need less tone mapping. This would be more accurate, but comparing this to other HDR displays, which I know we haven't talked about a lot of other HDR displays. Uh, I think it's very good. I think it's very good overall for what we're seeing, uh, for what we're seeing out there. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, we've run out of time, unfortunately. I was going to spend a little time talking about actual content, but uh, we're we're pretty pretty well done here today. And uh, we we spent a lot of time sort of preparing people for what we're going to do in the future. And I look forward very much to doing more of these TVs with you. Uh, next up, in fact, is the uh, LG C7 OLED, which is their I guess I I guess you would call it a the entry level OLED. There's also a B7. But that's what's called a captive brand. It's only at one store. I forget whether it's Best Buy or Costco or I don't know where. But it's that's that's going to be what's called a captive brand. The generally available uh, entry level OLED is a C7, which you just got into your studio and uh, put a little time on it. I think, and uh, pretty soon we'll you'll get some measurements, and I'll come over and we'll talk about that. We'll look at some content and um, have you come back and and talk about that TV. Can't wait. Yeah, it's going to be super cool. Well, man, this has been just great. Um, super geeky, but hey, the show is Home Theater Geek. So what do you expect, huh? <laughs> um, and uh, so I'm looking forward to that again. And I want to, for now, thank you so much for being here and uh, putting all this time in. And it's been very informative. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for having me. You bet. That's uh, Dave Abrams. Uh, you can contact him through his website, avical.com. That's A-V-I-C-A-L.com. Uh, and, uh, man, if you want a calibrator, he's the best. There's nobody better. There are many good calibrators around the country, but uh, none better than Dave, I'd say. You can always find me at avsforum.com. You can email me at scott at twit.tv. And you can email me. Uh, you can email me, yes. And you can follow me on Twitter. <laughs> at HTGeekScott and at AVS Forum. You can always find previous episodes of Home Theater Geeks right here at twit.tv slash HTG and on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash twit 
home theater geeks. Next week, my guest geek is scheduled to be Darren Fong of Out of Your Head. <laughs> That's the name of his company and his product. Uh, we're going to be return to headphone virtualization. We talked about this last week, and we're going to come back to it with Darren uh, about how he creates software that simulates different speakers in different rooms on headphones so that you're, you're listening on headphones and you think you're listening to, or you hope, we hope you're thinking that you're listening to speakers in a room. Uh, so it's really interesting, and I do hope you will join us for that. Until then, geek out. <laughs>